Michael Good morning. Wyoming. Warm welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. To those joining us in person and joining us on Zoom. I'm Ray Sunby, president of the Humanist Community. And humanism is a secular and reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge for the greater good. If you want to join the humanist community, you can find out how to join on our website, www.humanists.org. And we would appreciate any donations to support presenting these forums on a regular basis. And you can donate also on our website, www.humanist.org. Uh, hello, our speaker this morning. We're very happy to have uh, uh, Richard uh, Duda with us. He, for 18 years, he uh, worked on pattern recognition at uh, SRI International. And he's very interested in uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, very big in the news. I mean, just every day, you never know what you're gonna read. And, uh, and so we're really interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Scott. Um, Scott introduced me as Richard Duda. I'm also known as Dick Duda. Uh, and I'm ha happy to be here this morning to speak to you, even if it's via Zoom, uh, tell you a little bit about what I know about these AI chatbots. So uh, I, I would like to add a word or two about my background. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training, um, but I did spend 25 years doing artificial intelligence research. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that uh, those uh, I started doing that 60 years ago. So um, I'm, I'm, I try to keep up with the field. Uh, the field really has made uh, great strides in the last 20 years. Uh, and so, I'll do my best. I hope I won't mislead anybody. Um, with that disclaimer, I'd like to share my screen, if I can do that. Oh, it says host has disabled participant from screen sharing. Just wait a second, we'll get it going. There we go. Okay, I'll try again. Uh, still not. No. There we go. Okay, so let me... Open the screen up. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is uh, AI Chatbots, Their Promise and Problems. Um, what I plan to do is to first define my terms, what are AI chatbots, and then say a little bit about how they work. I, I can't explain it all in detail. I don't even understand all of it in detail. Uh, but I think it really helps to understand their limitations by knowing how they do what they do. Uh, I'll focus on the particular chatbot called ChatGPT. It's the one that has gotten the most attention. There are others, and more will be coming out, I'm sure. Um, talk about what they might be good for, which is a lot of things. Uh, it's really impressive. Um, but what problems they have, and they have a lot of problems. Um, so, uh, what else is new? Uh, if there's a takeaway message I'd like you to have from this particular presentation. It's that AI chat chatbots seem to know everything. Uh, it's hardly a topic you can bring up they can't say something about. They're astonishingly fluent. They produce wonderful English, um, kind of to the point, concise, but um, and this is something you should always remember, they don't understand anything they're talking about. So with that, uh, let's launch into things. Uh, what's a chatbot? Well, anybody who has a cell phone or a computer and has done online shopping has undoubtedly had uh, experience with them. It's a computer program that simulates a conversation with a human user, uh, typically user, used in customer service. Uh, so if you chat with uh, an agent, um, 
it goes back and forth until you either get what you want or you give up in frustration. Um, what is artificial intelligence? Well, it's a part of computer science. It's a subfield concerned with programming a computer to generate intelligent behavior. And typically it has many components, many aspects. Um, there's machine learning, uh, there's speech uh, recognition, there's computer vision, natural language processing, uh, expert systems, planning optimization, game playing, um, there's robotics, which tends to draw on all of these. Uh, I'm only going to talk a little bit about two, which is machine learning, which is an important part, and uh, the natural language processing. So an AI chatbot is just a chatbot that uses some of these techniques, and particularly machine learning and natural language processing, so that they can carry on a human-like conversation. And it generally operates in a simple loop. Um, the user uh, enters some question or request, uh, and then the program has to try to an analyze that request and figure out what the intention is, and if it doesn't match anything that the program knows about. And if so, uh, the program has to compose a reply and send it back to the user, and then that the user will ask another question or clarify or do whatever until either the user gets the answer and or gives up. They've been around quite a long time. Uh, I think the first, you can say the first chatbot was in 1964 when a researcher named Joe Weizenbaum at MIT created a program that com every computer science student knows called ELISA. Uh, Eliza simulated a psychiatrist, uh, a, a very special kind of psychiatrist that was a Rogerian. It, uh, it basically uh, just asked questions and tried to evoke responses uh, from the user. So here's an uh, example. I'm not going to go through this script, but what you can, if you do look at it, you'll see that uh, Eliza is just picking up on certain keywords. If it sees the word uh, unhappy or depressed or anxious, uh, it feeds back, uh, it basically asks, tell me more. So that was followed by a number of commercial applications that particularly when the, when the internet allowed people to come online and they had customer service things, so I forgot to mention, uh, Eliza could be called the first generative chatbot. I'm gonna underline that word, uh, generative. It generates uh, English sentences of a restricted sort. So it was followed up by uh, customer service bots. Uh, and then uh, th there were also speech activated bots and most famous uh, is Siri, uh, came out in 2010 and Alexa in 2014. And I'm sure all of you have encountered these things. What about the AI chat box? That's the new boy on the block. Uh, well, their AI techniques uh, come in a couple of flavors. There's what's called symbolic AI and artificial neural networks. And I'm really not going to say anything about symbolic AI, uh, although it plays a role. Uh, the neural networks are the, a major component of them. And they are based on a really very, very simple models of the brain. Um, they're programmed primarily by giving the, the program examples. Uh, you, you're, you show the program things and tell it what the response should be, uh, and the program has to self-adjust to learn. And in particular, the architecture allows very fast execution. Uh, and that, that'll be one of the things I think, well, it's one of the things that impressed me the most when I used ChatGPT. Uh, I type in a question, and within a fraction of a second, I'm getting paragraphs come out at me. Um, th that That's enabled a lot by the special hardware that goes with these artificial neural networks. So since they are brain models, I'd like to spend 30 seconds or more or less, more or less, on what we know about the brain, which is, of course, that's a a two-year college class, which uh, 
I will just super say, if you look at any little area like this section of the visual of the cortex up here, you'll see a dense tangle of, of millions of neurons. And if you keep looking closer and closer, you'll see an individual nerve cell, which has its parts, it has a body, and it has uh, pr uh, processes called dendrites that make the connections to other neurons. Uh, and they come in various sizes and shapes in the brain. And the one thing you can, I'm going to say about it is um, there are a hell of a lot of neurons in the brain, uh, estimated something like 10 to the 11th. Uh, and they're all kind of active all the time. Some are sort of sleepy, um, but that means that a lot of parallel operation is taking place. If you look individually at, at a particular neuron, oh, for saying that, I should say that um, People have studied uh, uh, functional neuroanatomy and they know what parts of the brain do different things. So we know very well where speech recognition is occurring, where vision is happening, where emotions are, short-term memory, uh, reasoning, um, but we, there's a lot we don't know. If you look way down at the individual neuron, uh, it receives inputs from other neurons uh, the inputs go into points of contact, which are called synapses, and they have they they can grow. These synapses uh, grow with experience, um, or they shrink. Also, they atrophy. It depends on you know, whether it's use it or lose it. That's the way the human body works. Um, the output of the neuron is a train of pulses that come down a long process called an axon. Um, and the information is actually carried by the pulse rate, how many uh, spikes per second that are firing. Uh, the output goes to other neurons in the brain, uh, and that so it either they, they can either stimulate or inhibit the activity of other neurons. So it's possible to make this very simple model of this. Uh, in fact, it's easy to. Uh, in the simple model, you say, well, we have inputs that represent those firing rates of the other neurons. Uh, and each input is given a certain number of volts, let's say, or uh, synaptic strength, however you want to say it. So if some inputs may be very important, they get a lot of votes. Uh, some may be less important. Some may even have negative votes, um, which would inhibit the neuron. And what happens is that the neuron adds up the, the products of the inputs and the voting for each input. And that sum is not the output directly because uh, it could get very large or very small. Uh, there's a saturation limit. Uh, neurons can only fire so fast. They can, typical neuron, well, if you don't do anything at all, if there's no stimulus, you'll get one or two pulses a second randomly. Uh, when it gets really excited, it can fire a thousand or 1500 pulses a second, but that's about the limit. So, the result is the output of this model neuron is uh, compressed. Uh, there's a, this graph I show shows that if the if that sum is negative, we get a very low output. If the sum is positive, you get a large output. Uh, that can be normalized to be viewed as a probability. You can scale that from zero to one, and you can talk about the probability that a neuron has detected something. So there are ways that are known for adjusting the, the weights. The, the behavior of this neuron depends entirely on how many votes the inputs get and what the inputs are, of course. Um, you can adjust those votes and change the way it behaves. And that process of changing the weights is called training. Uh, you do it by giving it examples and telling it, do you want the neuron to have a strong response or a, a weak response and adjust the weights accordingly. Uh, that's been known for a long time. When I was doing research back in the in 1962, people knew had good methods for handling a single neuron. Problem is that a single neuron can't do very much. Um, so you want to put them together in a network. Uh, and there are a lot of network architectures. Uh, the network architectures are they're all simple models of the brain. Here's a very common network architecture. It's called a feed-forward network. Uh, the inputs come from a layer, actually it could be sensory neurons. Think of the, the neurons in the retina of your eye. Um, and they get 
fed through successive layers. I'm showing three layers here, but it could be seven or eight or 10 until you finally get to an output. And of course, we have all these variable weights that the, they, they're the ones that will determine what the network does. Uh, and this, this becomes a very flexible function. You can get, you can adjust those weights to get almost any relation you want between the input and the output. Uh, the problem is to get the correct relationship. So here's an example of how it might work. Uh, imagine that the input is the retinal cells that are activated by seeing a picture of a cat. Um, the first layer might detect some features of that cat, um, you know, uh, what the colors are, what the, their edges, uh, spots, and so on. Uh, ultimately, you want to identify it. Uh, so some subsequent layer might say, well, I think this is uh, likely to be a dog. But I'll give you a 60% probability, but there's a 30% probability it might be a, a cat or might even be a bear, although I don't think so. And that in turn could lead to output neurons that cause muscle actions to either decide to feed it or to get out of its way. Uh, so this would be a kind of a neural network. Uh, you want to, of course, teach it by showing it not only pictures of cats, but pictures of things that are not cats. Uh, and you have to give it a lot of examples depending upon how many of those are in the network. The rule of thumb is you ought to have about 10 times as many examples uh, as you have adjustable weights. So it really depends on, to, to perform well, you have to have a big network of lots of weights, but that means you need a lot of data. It does allow this parallel execution. You present the input, you flash a picture on, and very quickly, the outputs of the successive layers can be computed, and there's special hardware to do that. There's a company called NVIDIA that builds uh, matrix multiplier boards that will do this quite rapidly. The real problem is getting the right weight values. And there was a breakthrough in 1989 uh, when an algorithm called the back propagation algorithm was produced. Uh, it was able to work with multi-layer networks. And that solved a problem that uh, I had been working on and never was able to solve. Um, how to handle multi-layer networks that are large. And that was called deep learning. Um, if you hear the expression deep learning, that's what it, you're, they're talking about. And of course, in order to do that, you need lots of examples and you need big data, uh, which the internet cheerfully provides. There was another breakthrough that occurred in 2012, which was language models. Uh, people recognized that the input to a neural network doesn't have to be sensory. It doesn't have to be a, a voice or a sound, or a picture. Um, it can be words. And the first application was to say, uh, given a sequence of words, uh, can we get a neural network that will compute the probability of what the next word will be? So the, here you have a neural network that's going to be pretty large because you're going to, there are a lot of possible net, next words. Uh, and the input will be a, a, a sequence that's streaming through. So for example, if you say a stitch in time, uh, what do you think the next word might be? And the network, when it's trained, might say, well, I'll bet it saves. Um, but it could be flies because time flies or be the time of my life, or it could be all kinds of things, uh, but uh, that's my current guess. And then when the next word comes in, it becomes more and more confident. It says, oh boy, I think the next word might be nine, and maybe that's the end, and maybe another sentence is starting. So you've all encountered this, I'm sure, if you've used uh, um, a uh, messaging program to send a text message, uh, it will try to auto-complete for you. It will guess the next word. And that was used in Google Translate, um, guess the sequence of words going back to 2015. Uh, another breakthrough which really helped the translation process was in 2017, uh, an architecture called Transformers, which has nothing to do with PG&E. Uh, Transformers is a, is a network uh, and architecture that deals with 
uh, long sequences of sentences um, rather than with individual word level. I'm not going to try to explain it. Uh, I will show you a diagram that you can look up on Wikipedia of a simple diagram of a transforming architecture. I will only point out it has an input, which would be the that would come from the user typing in requests and answers. It has an output, which would be well, the internal output would be probabilities of words that are coming. But notice uh, there are two neural networks in here uh, embedded, one processing the input data, but the important one, uh, which is involved in a loop, because the output of that network is fed back, changed, shifted, but fed back to the input. So now the output becomes a whole sentence or a series of sentences, of paragraphs. Uh, a final output might be a that's the end. And so this is this process runs, uh, and I'm not going to explain it. Um, there, there are several explanations uh, that you can look up as homework for the user, for the listener. So that did enable things called large language models. And there are several of them. <clears throat> Probably the first was done by Google. It's called Lambda. Um, Meta, which uh, was old Facebook, uh, has their own la large language models. Uh, there's a large language, there's, there's several of them. The one used in uh, chat GPT is called GPT-3. Uh, it's, uh, I'll explain it's a, well, I'll say, I, I'm gonna focus on that. GPT uh, and its chat program are the, the, the ones that are, have gotten the most attention. So what is GPT-3? Uh, GPT-3 is a transformer-based language model developed by a small company called OpenAI. They're, they're based in San Francisco, uh, have about 350 employees. They were started uh, several years ago by people with a rather altruistic motive. They wanted to, they're called OpenAI because they wanted to have their work uh, not be a corporate uh, secret, but open to everybody so you know how their stuff works. Um, and they've since developed a, a private wing that is uh, trying to apply this to commercial applications. So the G stands for generative, um, means that it generates uh, sentences or paragraphs. It's P stands for pre-trained. And the notion there is that yes, it is trained, a huge amount of data used to train it, but not with the most recent information. So it doesn't know a lot about anything that happened in the last two years. Uh, you can tune it up with recent information, but uh, GPT-3 itself uh, doesn't know anything more than a couple of years ago. And T stands for that transformer architecture that I just mentioned. Okay, so chat GPT is a chatbot that uses that GPT-3 language model. Uh, it's one of a number of them. Uh, it happens to have over 700,000 weights in it. And it's been trained on literally trillions of documents uh, on the internet, you know, all of uh, Wikipedia and so forth. Uh, you can think of it as autocomplete on steroids. Uh, and it is certainly in the news. Uh, it's hardly a day goes by you don't see something that was a Cover issue of Time in January. It's been covered in The Economist several times. On television, uh, Fox worries that it's uh, kind of biased toward uh, liberal positions. It, there are just story after story comes out uh, every time you open the paper or a magazine. Um, it, it has sh shaken up things at, at Google and other companies. They're all, you know, basically open AI. Uh, released a, a kind of a, a tiger that they're chasing and trying to catch the tail of. Uh, Elon Musk, who was one of the founders of OpenAI, is calling for a moratorium while they figure out what risks there might be to it. Uh, it's very doubtful that any mor moratorium will come. Uh, there's an article called The Alarming Deceptions at the Heart of an Astounding New Chatbot. So uh, if, I don't know how many people have actually used it, you might, if you haven't used it, you might wonder what's so astounding about it. Um, 
Well, when I went on online and used it, that I asked what kinds of things it can do, it says it can answer questions, it can hold a conversation with you, it can look up things. So, so it does all this stuff. And uh, I, I sent out a, a list of, of, of interactions I've had with G chat GPT. I don't know how many of you have read it. Um, if you have, you've seen some of the things it can do. I'm gonna give only one example. I don't have time to, to give many. Um, I asked it one time, can you write advertising copy for a toothbrush that can also be used to unclog drains and pick locks? And it responded, introducing the ultimate multitasking tool, the drain brush toothbrush. Not only does this innovative toothbrush effectively clean your teeth and promote healthy oral hygiene, it also serves as a handy tool for unclogging drains and picking locks. Its durable bristles and compact size make it perfect for reaching small spaces and removing stubborn blockages, while its precision tip allows for precise lock picking. With the drain brush toothbrush, you'll never have to carry multiple tools or call a professional for help with pesky clogs or stuck locks. Keep it in your bathroom or carry it with you on the go for quick and easy access to these handy features. Say goodbye to cluttered toolboxes and hello to convenience with the train, drain brush toothbrush. Order yours today. And I think that's pretty astounding. Um, if, if I had been asked a, a month before this was released, it could do, there were programs that could do this, I would have been very skeptical. And now Microsoft has really made a link with chat with um, OpenAI. They are uh, one of the funders. They recently announced they're going to spend up to $12 billion on developing things. And if you've gotten the new version of Windows 11, uh, you can use Bing, which is, and the Bing AI is their chatbot based on GPT-4, which is definitely a better language model than GPT-3. Uh, and soon to come, maybe, will be uh, Microsoft's Copilot, uh, Microsoft 365 Copilot. It integrates uh, all the Office systems. So as an example, I'm told, uh, you'll be able to say, uh, go, be able to tell it, uh, go to my mailbox and look up the messages I've received that talk about um, the problems with, with uh, chat GPT, and then uh, make a summary and create a three-point PowerPoint slide. And it's promising that they'll be able to do things like this. Um, so what are these chatbots good for? Um, well, I think in particular, they are going to provide some actually helpful customer service. They'll know, know something about the products. They can be tuned up, not just use the general knowledge, but knowledge about a product line. Uh, they could be in a very helpful assistant. They may not replace reference librarians or research assistants, but boy, if I were, if I had those jobs, I would certainly want to use it to help me out. Uh, I think they can be pretty good tutors for individualized instruction. Um, I, they can be, I think, uh, really play a useful role as a companion for the elderly, tell them stories, uh, people who are shut in. Uh, I see a really good future there. And many more things that I cannot envision. Uh, it's, it's opened a new door. But they have problems. Uh, the most important problem is they are not trustworthy. Remember I said at the very beginning, you can't believe them. Uh, their answers are frequently incorrect. If they don't, if they don't know, so if they don't have an answer that really matches well what you asked, uh, they'll cobble to get something together. It's rare for them to say, I don't know. They will occasionally, but it's rare. Uh, their answers are sensitive in how you ask the question. If you ask a different way, you'll get a different answer. And GPT-3 cannot cite references or explain how do they get their answer. Uh, I was noticing using Bing with GPT-4 that it, something somebody is providing references. So uh, maybe they're going to fix that up. There, These problems can be solved uh, or in part ameliorated maybe. They're particularly bad at mathematics and logic. Um, there's one kind of problem, for example, what's the next number in this sequence? And you say one, 
4, 88, 285, 9,275. These are the kinds of questions people ask to see if you're good at inductive logic. And I put it to chat GPT and it said that this pattern seems to involve multiplying the previous number by three and adding one. For example, four is obtained by multiplying one by three and adding one. Well, that's right. 88 is obtained by multiplying four by three and adding one. Wait a minute. Four times three is 12, adding one is 13. 88 is not obtained by that. Uh, using that, this is crazy. Um, but it's so confident, right? You, you, you might just take the answer and not check it. They can produce offensive output. That's been noted early on. In fact, the very first chatbot of the sort that uh, Meta unleashed, uh, within 24 hours, it was giving all kinds of racist uh, responses, and they shut it down. Um, they're already eliminating some jobs. Uh, people are, 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 their jobs will be either augmented or eliminated, and they are interfering with uh, education. The way you know, students have quickly picked up on it, using it to write little essays. Um, they can spread disinformation. Uh, and I think malware, it, when you get your email message uh, telling you that your bank is doing something or other, it'll be much harder to tell if that was a real message from your bank or not. Um, and they're undermining trust, uh, not only trust in those chatbots, but now everything you find on the internet, you have to worry, was that thing produced by a, a language model? Um, so. Here we are with my takeaway message. Uh, these things are know a lot, and uh, unfortunately, they don't understand anything. So there, you can dig deeper. I'm I, I'm going to send out references, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I think it's time for me to quit and for you to discuss. So what do you think about that? And I'll close. Oh, okay, um, I'm going to walk the mic around. And those that are online can use the um, raise hand feature. And I'll try to get people in the order in which they put their hands up. Uh, it's very challenging. Like there were two people all at once. So I have to choose between you. And, but that's OK. And, and of course, if I, you, I have to promise that I won't be able to answer a lot of the questions. That's OK. Do, it, do your best. Uh, it's usually what the speakers do anyway. And uh, please watch. Huh? Make up an answer. Make up an answer. Anyway, and please watch your airtime. That is, if you're going to ramble on forever, I'm going to cut you off. So, okay, uh, we'll start in the room here. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, Hold it to your box. Here. Right. Are uh, chat boxes sensitive to tone like fear or joy in how they respond? That's a good question. And the answer is yes, they are in the sense that they know the words. If, if you use the words fear or love or whatever, um, they will find things that are very relevant to that. Uh, they don't understand, they do not feel those emotions. Uh, it's, a, it's a program. It doesn't feel anything. Uh, and that's why I say they don't know what they're talking about. The, the word fear is a series of characters. Is, you know, fear is one six six five three two nine. Uh, but they will find matches of that and respond. And there was one reporter on the New York Times named Kevin Roos who got into a conversation uh, and the, the chatbot proceeded to try to tell Kevin that the chatbot loved him and that his wife didn't care about him and he, he should leave his wife and, and be with her. Crazy, crazy stuff. Okay, go ahead. So there's a lot of uh, crap on the internet as it is. And if that's the input to chat GPT, uh, much of the work must be filtering out the crap before chat GPT sees it. And then on the output side, uh, also, well, also having human beings confirm the answers. And that seems like an infinite 
problem because there's an infinite number of questions that could be asked. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I do know that humans get involved in trying to screen out some of the bad information. They're, they're, you're right, you're totally correct. There's garbage of all sorts on the internet. Um, there, there is a tune-up process uh, that can be used both to specialize the, the models to you know, new areas of knowledge, let's say. Um, and and you know, obviously you don't want a chatbot referring to uh, 16th century physics books or biology books uh, to give you information about physics and biology. Um, the, they've a, the, the companies who are making these things are aware of that problem and they are laboring to resolve it, but it's it's hard to take a system that's total that's automatic and screens through billions of things to to check it all out. Now, there's a, there's fact checking is not easy. Okay, it looks like um, someone uh, in the um, outside the room is uh, Michael has his hand up. So Michael, why don't you ask your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I consider myself within the room, but the virtual room. <laughs> but but uh, uh, anyway, uh, so uh, what chat GPT demonstrates is the limit of what uh, can be learned from the language alone. Uh, and uh, this is the fact that many brainiacs probably don't fully appreciate uh, how important uh, it is to have the physical experience of interacting uh, with the world, with things, and uh, with uh, other people uh, for uh, real understanding the world. I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm, I'm going to ask Michael a question. Michael, did you have a chance to read my my discussion with Chat GTP? Yeah, 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 yeah. I did, okay. uh, and uh, and so I also I saw many other similar examples demonstrating this limit. Okay, so well. Actually, th th thank you for uh, setting me up on that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And so so it, it's not even on the track to human uh, level uh, AI, uh, but uh, it's just uh, an interesting illustration of yeah. well, how much can be done going in. Right. Well, that, that actually is one of the questions that I asked Chat GPT. I said, uh, can you? Wouldn't it be helpful uh, to have um, cameras and touch sensors and things so that you actually experience the world and not have everything just uh, in, in symbolic form? Yeah, and it demonstrated that it understands the, its own limitations, right? Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah one, one of its answers, it said um, something like, you know, well, I can tell you about the capital of a country, but I don't know what a capital is. And I don't know what a country is. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> uh, well, that was very honest of the of the program, um, but it also pointed out you don't you don't have to have cameras and microphones because we do have people uh, who, who can teach it, and so it, it can gain some level of understanding uh, th through that process. And in addition. I'm sure it could be augmented by models. If you if they built models of the, of you know, of, the, of the world of various kinds. Um, I think that's in the future. I think uh, you know the the present is the present. The future could be quite different. Okay, uh, oh, Dad, um, why don't you ask your question? Yeah, I have a question. The AI is based on language, yeah, and as I know from past learning, that the way you think affect your language or your language affect the way you think. Russian think differently than Chinese and American. Now, the, if the AI is based on the language, it will not cover people with other languages. That means Chinese will not, the AI that develop here in America will not work for China or Russia. So if you want to know what Putin intend to do using AI, we cannot because the Russian think differently. How do you want to solve this issue? Well, I, I think there are two questions there, actually. One is a practical question. If, if you want to have language models uh, for other languages, um, 
does that mean we're, you know, in a practical sense, is, is that going to be a huge obstacle? And then the other question is philosophical, which is, uh, you know, do people really think differently in different languages? And I'm sure to some extent it's true. Uh, Noam Chomsky had an article six weeks or so ago, uh, basically said, you know, talking about the limitations of, of these large language models. Uh, they, they don't learn anywhere near the way humans learn. Um, they don't, you know, humans don't need to have millions of examples to understand what a cat is. Um, so philosophically, I think we are far away from, from doing what humans do. It's the, the, you know, the problem is, in my view, we impute to a program like ChatBT knowledge that it doesn't have or understanding, is a better way to say it, that it doesn't have. Um, it, it, humans are so good at jumping to conclusions and yeah. thinking yeah. That, that this program understands something. Um, it, it, it can, it, it, I'll say I was taken in. I've had some conversations where I got the feeling that, gee, I'm, I'm really talking to a smart guy here. Um, there we are. But if, to your, your, your earlier question, do, would we have to do something special for Russian? I'm sure it would have to be tuned up for Russian. I don't think, I'm not sure that you have to do a major work, um, but for sure translation is, is difficult if you want to do it really well. I think English is full with idioms like Troy to the dogs or putting the nail, the last nail. Yeah. And um, if the AI based on English, every other people during the world, uh, all over the world, we not understand it. That, that, that's certainly true. And, and every language has its idioms. Yeah. So how we deal with that? If you want to have communication uh, using AI or to the world? Yeah, I, I will defer to the people building these things. So I, don't, I don't have a, an answer. OK. Um, we're gonna, we, we, I just want everybody to know that, that um, uh, there are two people online but the second person online is going to be the third person I'm going to call on because we have a local person here. And uh, by the way, most of this is 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 conjecture and close to to uh, fiction, right? So uh, let me. Okay, Matthew, I, I understand you know more about this issue than maybe most of us. Uh, I don't know about that. I I have played around a little bit with chat GPT and I, I do have some questions about that, but specifically um, there is a YouTuber uh, named Sabina Hoffenfelder. I probably did not pronounce her name properly, but she has a video that's been up a few weeks ago that talks about chat GPT. And even though most of us know that uh, who's played around with chat, chat GPTs knows that uh it doesn't always answer questions properly. She claims that if you interrogate it on particularly like language type questions, and I don't have a good example of that, uh, it seems to have a pretty good idea about language and can respond. It, it seems to actually understand language itself. Does that mean it understands something and actually knows something or what? What do you think? Well, I, I would distinguish between knowing and understanding. Okay. Um, and this is not a not a technical definition. This is my my view of it. Uh, chat. Uh, I'll put it in, in air quotes here. Chat knows things. What, what it knows at the level that it can make a match. Uh, so it it can say that the input that I got from this user matches very well these ten documents, right? And so it it knows them in that sense. Understanding, it has to, for, you know, if you talk about a cat, uh, when you use the word cat, you can go to the dictionary and look up C-A-T and find out that it's a whatever, but we all have experiences with cats, right? We know how they respond if you, if you approach them too quickly, or it, we know so many things about cat behavior uh, that, GPT has these language models have no awareness at all. You know, what does it feel like when you pet them? Uh, can you right, feel but chat GPT doesn't have hands. 
if you gave chat GPT hands, allowed it to pet cats, would it have a better understanding? Would, would it understand cats that had eyes to see the cat? Would it, I mean, if you combine all these inputs, would eventually it have something? It, it would know a lot more about, it would know a lot more about a cat than, than I do in terms of things like, you know, it would know the cat physiology. It could tell you uh, statistics yeah. about cats. It would have, it would have a tremendous amount of knowledge about cats. Um, but uh, whether or not you could, you know, would a cat be uh, happy if you put it in a fish tank? Uh, it probably wouldn't know because it wouldn't find anything about Maybe cats. Maybe I should ask a slightly different question. Does it have an understanding of cats, just not the same understanding we have of cats? Oh, yeah. I'm sure it does. Yeah. So it does kind of understand something, just not the same way. It, it's it's very alien uh, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It, Okay, thanks. I'll let the next person go. That's, that's, an, that's an opinion. No, this is yeah. all opinion. Okay, yeah, it's my, uh, I'm a user of ChatGPT uh, because I worked in AI in the 80s you know, in my previous life. Uh, I don't have really a question, but some of the observations that I made of ChatGPT, I tried to write poetry and asked it to proofread. It, it was pretty good. When I asked it to translate from one language to another, it was not good. And it even except uh, mentioned that, that the subtleties of different languages and all these stuff and the emotional part of it and the cultural nuances, it's not very good at it. It, it's, it stays right away before even it translates. And then yeah, I asked it to write poetry in different languages, including English. In English, it was pretty good, but in other languages, it does have, I guess the information has not been fed into it enough to uh, associate it or understand the cultural nuances of different language groups. I also tried to let it to write some software code, and I was pretty surprised. It can even write in Unity 3D, but I didn't execute the code, so I don't know whether it was a good code or not, but it can write at least. So what I feel is also like I tried with physics questions as well, and it can give some simple answers, but if you go into the depth, it still lacks some of those uh, innovative stuff that human brain can do. So my question is that it seems like a lot of the technical editing and also the Google search engines can be replaced by chat GPT. And it's pretty good at it. And a lot of the jobs we lose because of that, because it can compose pretty good emails. <laughs> I was totally shocked. So what are the areas that we humans should be skilled enough not to be replaced by these uh, objects like chat GPT? Well, I, I think the, the bigger question is what's going to be coming down the road in another five years? Um, that, and nobody knows. Um, I, I agree with all the observations you made, by the way. Um, I, I also tested out writing programs. Um, it, 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 can, it can basically write any program you'd give a, 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 freshman, a freshman student in computer science to do. You want to do a bubble sort, it'll do a bubble sort program and so on. Um, if you give it a, any significant program, it's, it'll be full of bugs. Um, so that's what, where we are in the year 2023. Um, I think the reason people are so concerned, the ones who are, is where might this go from here? And my guess is is no better than anybody else's in this uh, room. But I'll, I'll just say that I was quite startled at how good it is at things that I didn't think computers could ever do. Okay. Um, I don't know who's there. Uh, um, 
Dana, is it Dana? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm curious what you think about what's the, what's the big risk in my mind, which is I've read a lot of science fiction and uh, in a number of stories, the AI in robot form or some other form decides that it, <clears throat> it's not happy with humans and eliminates humans. Oh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Uh, you know more than I do um, on that. Yeah. Okay, so we got yeah. a local person here. Oh, did you want to say something else? I I, I just want to say there are a lot of stories in a uh, <clears throat> they're oh. they're plausible, and I, I so I'm a little worried about what we got now. Right now, it's not a threat, but another 10, 20, 30 years, it might be. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I will say is that there have been various calls for government regulation. Uh, Congressman Ted Liu has a bill uh, for regulating AI. There was this open letter that came out from uh, Elon Musk and others that people have signed uh, calling for a moratorium. I think there are serious concerns, but I don't think the legislators know what they're dealing with. And, you know, right. The restrictions that they would put on may be pointless. Um, right. So, um, I, to, to some extent, I guess you have to uh, trust that the damages will be limited. And I'm, I'm not a doomsayer. So, uh, I hope that people will find the good uses and somehow control the abuses. Okay. Hi, my name is Ray Sunby, as I have announced earlier, and I've got a comment. I listened to a radio show, I think it was, fairly recently that talked about the mind's eye and how some, most people can picture things. If you say bear, most people can picture a bear in their mind, but there are some people that can't do that. They know a lot of things about bears, but they can't picture one. And the question is, what do you see going forward in this AI related to visual image analysis and being able to picture things as opposed to just working with words? Well, in fact, uh... OpenAI has a program called DAL-E, D-A-L-L-E, that you can give it a description of a picture. You can say, I, I'd like to have a picture of a teddy bear uh, riding on a rocket ship carrying uh, three balloons, and it will generate pictures. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you recall, when I ended my, when I ended my talk, there was a mosaic of lots of pictures of uh, an elderly professor looking puzzled. And they were various versions that, that I generated uh, using, actually I used stable diffusion, which is another one of these generative programs. Uh, so the answer is that yes, uh, it can generate art of a sort. Uh, it can generate, there are music generating programs that uh, my opinion are generating very poor music, but uh, that's my opinion. Um, Again, we're on the beginnings of these things. And is this, is this a dead end? Here's, I guess this is the question. Uh, are the neural networks a dead end? Have they gotten about as good as they can get? And uh, so it's going to saturate at this point and nothing further will develop? Or, or are we on the beginning of a breakthrough where all kinds of things will happen? And I, I frankly think that we're, I don't know. I don't know is the answer. I frankly think I don't know. Okay, uh, okay. So we're gonna. I'm gonna advance uh, Dick uh, ahead of you, uh, Michael, and then you you will be next. And we have someone in the room. So go ahead, Dick. Muted, Dick. Unmute yourself. Yeah, I have to go. Uh, I just want to comment on what Jerry said about the science fiction, and I'm not a science fiction reader. However and you've all heard this from me before, but I find all of this electronic stuff, the internet, chatbots and everything, totally dehumanizing. 
I feel totally irrelevant as a human being. I guess uh, no comment from that. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Michael. You're muted, Michael. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, two comments. Uh, first, about this question whether Chat GPT understands uh, the language. And uh, I think, uh, in some sense, it does understand the language in the sense that it understands the language structure. It understands um, uh, the connections uh, between different concepts uh, within the language. Uh, but this is not what we call understanding when we are talking about understanding. Uh, our understanding involves a lot of other things, like our memories, our emotions, how we feel, what, what we know at physical level, um, our other feelings, uh, and uh, in this sense, of course, it's not it's not that. But my another comment is about that uh, how good chat GPT in uh, some things that we consider considered used to consider creative, like uh, writing essays, writing poems, or drawing something even. Uh, it's maybe we have to rethink what we consider uh, creative uh, and uh, the words of this, what we, we believe to be that uh, original, innovative, uh, all this uh, different sorts of creativity, it's not really that difficult. It's not that hard to generate uh, some novel, uh, novel ideas, novel patterns, novel, novel text, and so on. What is really difficult and, and really important is to create something new that would be useful, that would help make our life uh, better, that would uh, help us uh, maybe uh, better care about ourselves. The, the, this is the hard part. part. And, and maybe the, this is where we have to focus our efforts, and not just on uh, creativity and innovations and all these things. AI is uh, equally good or even better than, than we are. In the, uh, okay. All right, Michael. Uh, well, I just want to let Diane know we got hands flying up in different places now, but Diane, you're going to be number three. We have two locals, and then we'll go to you, and then we'll come back here. Oh, is it you? you're right. Diane, you're mute, muted. Yeah. Oh. Uh, isn't uh, because ChatGPT uh, works on the information that we provide. Now we don't quite understand our brain as of today, and so ChatGPT will be limited by our understanding because we feed the information, and that from that information, ChatGPT comes up with with inferences and all this stuff comes up with their answers. But since humans have not understood, we are still exploring the brain, but we don't understand the complexities of it. For example, uh, take the common example of colors. Colors are nothing but the frequencies or spectrum. And how do we interpret the frequencies into different colors and how does it happen? We are still exploring that. So chat GPT will be limited by our lack of understanding. So it can evolve to, to that extent where we understand. So it will always, I find, and also doing all this experiment with the chat GPT on a limited basis on my limited understanding, I find that innovation it lacks. And can you comment on those uh, two questions? Thank you. Well, I, I guess my comment is I basically agree with your observations. Um, you know, things things like well, a color actually happens to be a particularly um, problematic uh, thing because every people uh, you know, perceive colors differently. We know about color blindness. Uh, uh, other animals look respond to very different parts of the color spectrum. Um, so, you know, what, what does what would how would chat GPT handle color? Um, you know, anything involving 
uh, qualia perceptions um, are are going to be difficult for for things like Chat GPT. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, Dick, yeah, I, I had a, a question about, you know, the concerns about AI taking over and and how it works, because my understanding, my, my feeling is that the big difference between human thoughts and AI is that everything we do is based on our desires. And the AI doesn't start with anything, any desires. It doesn't necessarily want to survive. I don't know if it knows what happiness is. It probably solves problem. It can achieve goals given it, but I don't think it has any goals of, of its own. Well, yeah, and I think that that'll leave it always a tool. You know, you know goal, goals can certainly be given to programs. Um, ChatGTP itself is a piece of. If you give it the goals, it'll do what it what it can to achieve them. I think that's the, the issue on on um, the science fiction, and I'm not a science fiction uh, expert in any form. But the basic fact is that uh, the, the stories which are repeatedly told are where people think they're giving a computer or a machine a good goal, and it turns out that they didn't have, understand that we, we humans, don't understand the full implications of the goals we give our machines. Okay, Diane, we're finally to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Dick, you mentioned at the very beginning um, three problems that you saw from um, not only the bots, but the whole artificial intelligence um, program. And one of them was trust. And it seems to me like um, following up on Bill Gates's very positive endorsement of AI as an from his standpoint, the ma most major breakthrough in the last 20 years, comparable to smartphones. Um, and, and of course, we're just at the cusp of it. We haven't seen the applications yet, but there seems to be no controls or accountability in social media. And so, um, and not that you can answer this, but particularly as a humanistic, organization and form, this seems to me like a tremendous project for you or for those who believe in what you believe, such as myself, to step up on incorporating ethics in our lives and responsibility and accountability ahead of these tanks or tools that will run us over. Was that a question? I meant well, it to be a question. Actually, you, you, remind, what you remind me of is there's a professor at Cal Berkeley named Stuart Russell, uh, who's he's going to be giving a talk in a couple of days. I don't, where is, I can't remember where it is now. In any case, Stuart Russell has written a, a, a book, which um, I can't remember the, the title. I, I'll put it, I, I'll, I'll send it in. But he, he worries about exactly the kind of question, Diane, that you, you raised. Uh, he suggests some criteria that could go into the design of AI programs that would uh, cause them to be aligned with human needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think his criteria are reasonable, but I don't see how they're operational. I, I, don't, I don't know. He, he's basically addressing the developers of AI systems and, and, and suggesting it's like a like, like medical doctors have a code of ethics, right? A Hippocratic oath and so on. Um, something similar should be done with people developing AI systems. Um, and yeah, that I, I agree with Russell in, in broad principles. And now the, the details how to do it is still to be worked out. Thank you. So um, I think in terms of the internet today and social media today and AI in the future, um, we need to have our kids kind of inoculated against bullshit. And that means education. 
uh, you know, training them on fallacies and how to uh, know good information from bad information, what are reliable sources, how to look for an agenda, how to see multiple sides of an argument um, in a world where anybody with $10 opposable thumbs and an agenda can say anything they want. Um, you can't just depend on it being, you know, uh, a URL somewhere with some text on it. Believe it. In terms of uh, applications, uh, in terms of education, uh, rather medicine, uh, doctors are very interested in getting rid of the paperwork that is uh, killing them now and patients as well. Uh, and then they can do the human things like that doctors used to do, uh, you know, being with people when they're in, in uh, you know, sick. And then the other thing that they, the other end of the spectrum that they can do, that this AI can do, is it's much better at looking at radiation x-rays to find cancers. A lot of it is, uh, right now they're, they're equivalent to what radiologists could do. And there's gonna be a crossover where they're gonna do a much better job. Uh, I'm just curious, do, do you know Michael Topol? T-O-P-O-L, uh, he's made that one of his major concerns. Uh, and just exactly the things you were talking about, uh, find ways to relieve the, the data entry jobs that are being pushed on physicians. Uh, uh, all the things you were talking about. Uh, so I, I think the medical field uh, is a really a good one for, for benefiting from th this technology. Uh, if, if, if instead of freeing up the physician so that the physician will have more time to spend with patients, uh, you can make sure that the hospital administrators uh, don't just give the physicians more work to do. You, you can now handle your patients in five minutes instead of 15, right? Increase your productivity. Ah, increasing productivity is, is a, a bad mantra. Okay, you know, and it seems to me that um, you could turn you could turn artificial intelligence on itself. It might be able to augment um, finding bad data as well, or bad talk, or whatever you think. Because right now it has to be done by human beings ultimately, but maybe it could handle ninety percent of the work. I didn't see anybody. Um, oh, by the way, can you comment on that? Or I? No, that's right. I agree. I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, so uh, surely somebody has something they wanna say, otherwise we'll have to close it down. Anybody? Oh, okay, well, we have uh, two hands, but his went up first. So, um, how, why am I blocking on your name? Jerry. Yeah, so all the stuff I've heard about ChatGPT is basically human chat GPT interaction. Has anybody ever tried to have chat GPT talk to chat, chat GPT and how does that turn out? <laughs> That'd be fun. I, I haven't heard that. Somebody ought to try that. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it would very soon wander off into a completely nonsensical wilderness. Hmm. Hello? Okay. Uh, I'd like to clarify the question I raised earlier about uh, um, basically I would like to know if the um, the tone, not the words, the tone, the emotional tone, or maybe this relates to the dialect of fear, joy, happiness. It seems to me. Those are not easily dealt with. For example, as a human being, I used to be able, when I was younger, I could tell the difference from Brooklyn, Bronx, 
Staten Island, Manhattan, and New Jersey. <laughs> well, now, are, are we talking about, uh, this, this sounds like speech, right? Not, not typed words or something. Um, if, uh, I guess if, if a user is, is, is using speech, that would be a, a definite issue. Uh, to, to try to understand intention, because you, you can, you know, as you, we can pick up on uh, something that's being sarcastic or being whatever. Um, that that might be a challenge to a computer. Uh, with, with typed input, uh, there is much more, I guess, room for misunderstanding. But well, by the way, this is true of, for people, right? When I get an email message from someone. Uh, I, I, every once in a while, I'm not sure, are they pulling my leg? Uh, what, what, was there something I was supposed to catch that I, I missed? Um, so yeah, those subtleties are clearly problems, I think, for, for people and computers. That's for sure. Okay, so um, Jim, you're next. Oh, you're, you're muted, Jim. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I have grave concerns about the weaponization of AI. I understand that China is striving to be predominant in the AI field, and I feel they probably have no compunctions about uh, developing weapons controlled by AI. And um, I'm sure our uh, military is also endeavoring to uh, develop these types of weapons. Uh, and I think the future is um, very much imperiled by AI in this respect. Oh, the future is imperiled by the nuclear weapons we have right now. Um, yeah, um, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, and, you know, I also know some people in the military who, who are pretty responsible, um, who, who do, you know, they have life and death decisions all the time on, the, on that kind of thing. Um, the human race doesn't have a good history of, uh, of using things uh, for good. Uh, so yeah, there will be misuse of AI as with everything else. Eventually, as Lord Keane said in the, when he was asked about uh, investing, or do, you, or do you worry about the long run? He says, in the long run, we're all dead. So that's where we are. So <clears throat> well, we just have to hope that we have leadership that, that is responsible and uh, and enough of an understanding of what we're dealing with. Uh, our, the risks here are coming from too few people really, even the, you know, the, the people with the best intentions not understanding what they they have. So one of the things that uh, I think uh, was trying to be brought out when you're talking about language and getting the wrong impression, uh, the term sarcasm comes to mind where, you know, I can say if I'm out with somebody and we see a bear, I could say, I'm so afraid and really mean it. Whereas if somebody, you know, threatens you that you're not afraid of at all, you could say, ooh, I'm so afraid and mean exactly the opposite. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so, um, wait, I got it. Everybody, okay. Um, uh, why am I blocking on huh? Jerry. Jerry, yeah, Jerry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to, by the way, we're running out of time. So we're, I'm going to quit in about uh, three minutes. So keep your comments short and if, if that's what you want to do. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, in, in response to the idea of weaponization, 
there's this movie called The Fordman Project where the United States decides to put all uh, put the whole control of its defense system into the hands of a supercomputer and they start it up and it's looking really fine but then it discovers that the Russians also have a supercomputer that that's doing this so it says I demand to talk to it and so they talk they start talking to each other well to make a long story short the two of them ally against the human race okay great all right that's interesting okay my, michael i i guess is there nobody else in the room so i i guess you get the last word yeah yeah a brief comment along the same lines uh, i think that uh, the main race may be not between say us in china the main race is between the humankind the humans and artificial intelligence that we are creating who will uh, survive in this race? Who uh, will uh, learn uh, to control? We will control the AI, or AI will learn to control us? That, that's the question of our time. Um, but uh, I'm not very optimistic about our chance. But anyway. Right. I guess I just say that we're going to be living in interesting times.